Yeah, I think uh, I will just uh, introduce everyone again. Like, so thank you for joining for the first talk of the Gen AI uh, Frontiers Topics in Gen AI. So our goal with the seminar series is to like, with this noise of all Gen AI, let's focus on more fundamental works. Like what is driving this uh, whole Gen AI hype in uh, whether academia or industry. And today, like we have our first uh, esteemed speaker, Elon Du, he's a final year PhD uh, candidate at the MIT. And he's been funded by the NSF uh, Graduate Research, and he has been previously research fellow at OpenAI. He still uh, he has worked at Fair and as well as the Google DeepMind. And so he will be talking about uh, generalizing outside the training distribution to compositional uh, generation. And you learn the floor is all yours. Great. Yeah. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, so yeah, today I'll talk a bit about some ideas of generalizing outside the training distribution uh, by using compositional generation. Uh, so a lot of my research in the last several years has been towards this goal of trying to construct in intelligent AI agents. So I want AI agents that can autonomously make a cup of tea or put out a fire. And to me, the biggest issue here is the question of generalization. We want to construct models that can robustly generalize outside the training distribution of demonstrations you've seen. So we want this agent to be able to do new tasks in new environments with other agents. And I think that, and, and a lot of my work has focused on the idea of using generative models towards solving this task. So I'll present two ideas on how generative models can help allow us to generalize outside the training distribution. So the first idea is the idea of implicit prediction. So normally uh, when we have a task such as climb up the stairs and I have an image here, uh, we, we, a neural network predicts a single output action, which is this trajectory. Uh, and this is great when your training and prediction distributions match. But the issue is when your environment changes, this action is no longer valid and you don't really have other alternatives. So one way to be able to, uh, so, uh, so, uh, to solve this issue is by constructing a generative model over all possible actions or like encode some preferences over each action. So this is the first idea, the idea of implicit prediction. So what we do is we take in an image observation as well as an action. Uh, and we essentially uh, input both into the neural network and we have the neural network output an energy, which represents the preference for that particular action. Under this formulation here, now, uh, now to infer an action, you do the search procedure where you find the action that minimizes the energy or maximizes likelihood. The benefit of this approach is that it allows you to adapt to new constraints at prediction time. So if at prediction time, I, I say, I want to uh, make sure that all my actions are safe or that they all preserve battery life. I can simply add a new energy function, something for prediction time constraints. Uh, and now I can just optimize for an action that, minimize, that op minimizes the summed up energies or maximizes the likelihood across these new constraints. So this generative approach toward pred towards prediction is much slower than just explicitly predicting the action, but has this benefit that it kind of allows you to reason. Uh, because you can now search through the energy landscape to find the action that minimizes the energy as well as your new constraints. But I think the other big thing that I'll talk about is this idea of using compositional generative models to generalize beyond the training data that's available. Uh, so in the last couple of years, we've seen large language models do very impressive things. Uh, so if we ask a large language model, what are the steps to construct AI? It will give you these step-by-step -step instructions. But at the same time, if we take multimodal variants of these large generative models and we ask them, given this image here, uh, is there a blue cup below a red bowl? It, it is unable to accurately generate an answer. So I think that this primarily relies, uh, is due to the distribution gap between natural language and maybe embodied data. And I think the biggest gap is that natural language is much simpler in nature. So natural language has been made by people and it's structured for very effective communication. So it's not so noisy and it's naturally compositional. So you can combine individual components together. In contrast, if you look at the pixels in an the image, they are not so compositional. Uh, and you, the data you see is only a really thin slice of the entire real world distribution you care about. So the thing that in my research I've been working on to try to address this issue is to use energy-based models as a way to compositionally represent these distributions. So what does that mean? 
So instead of modeling this training distribution directly by modeling this diagonal, my work has uh, do this is modeling these individual factors. So you want, you learn one energy-based model on axis one of this distribution, and you learn a sec second generative model on axis two of this gener uh, gen uh, distribution. And now by taking the product of these two distributions, you can cover this entire space of answers, even parts that are outside this original training distribution that you've seen. And in practice, these factors can be much more attractively estimated, uh, though they may be biased if you don't have the correct independent structure. I'll talk a bit later about how you can discover this correct independent structure as well as, and there's also this idea that with limited data, even if your estimator is biased, uh, it may be the best lowest variance answer, which this enables you to get. Uh, so I guess one question that we should ask is, well, but do we need any of this? Maybe all we need is to just gather all the data to fill in all the gaps. Uh, so if we look at the results from 2015 to the results in 2022, uh, the results in 2022 look much better than the ones in 2015. But there's a big difference uh, in the sense that generative models haven't just gotten larger over the years. There's also been many tricks that we've added uh, to make them better. So in 2018, we added this idea of class conditioning, where we tell this generative model, you want to generate image subject to this class identification. Uh, and in 2022, we have a more extreme version of this, where we condition the generative model on an entire text description, uh, which really reduces the multimodality that you have to model of images. And there's also been some changes in sampling. And finally, in 2022, we've done very, very careful data filtering. So if we take this really giant model in 2022, and we just remove these components, so if we actually sample from the original distribution learned by the model, uh, the samples look much, much worse. And if you remove this text conditioning, so it's the same base model, but you just remove text conditioning, and you remove this uh, uh, sampling from this modified distribution, now the samples look much worse. So overall, generative models haven't really magically gotten much better due to the computational skill, uh, but rather it has been due to a large number of technical uh, engineering uh, techniques. Um, and in general, generative models cannot fit these arbitrarily high dimensional distributions uh, by just uh, gathering more data, but rather they're really much better at, some, at fitting simple ones, such as when you have an image condition distribution given text. And another way to view the ideas I'll talk about in terms of compositional generation is as a way to attractively represent these very high dimensional distributions uh, by factorizing them into small components. So this talk will be structured into four different sections. So first I'll talk about the idea of energy-based models. Uh, then I'll talk about the algebra of compositionality with respect to these models. Uh, then I'll talk about how these models can be applied to robotics. And finally, I'll talk about how they can be more broadly applied to multimodal models. So if we have an energy function for, our, uh, for a function red trucks, this energy function will assign the image of a green truck high energy. Well, if you have an image of a red truck, it will assign a low energy. And essentially an energy-based model is this generative model that learns this landscape over the space of images where all red trucks have low energy and all other images have high energy. And this energy function can be used to encode many different functions. So on one hand, in a, in a, similar to the example at the beginning of the talk, you can have this energy function encode the utility or how good an action is. You can also have this energy function encode where, whether you're inside a set or not by having all points in the set have low energy and all other points have high energy. And finally, in the most broad sense, these energy-based models can encode any probability distribution function. So you can represent it using the Boltzmann distribution. So once you have this energy function, uh, how do you actually generate samples from it? So naively, if you just try to search for data points that have low energy, this will be exponentially hard as your dimensionality increases. So one thing you can do is you can use that neural network to help guide your sampling. So what you can do is you can use a gradient of the energy function to help you sample from the model. But this doesn't get you the entire distribution. So in 2019, we proposed this idea of using the gradient to help you guide your sampling, but also add some uh, stochastic noise so it becomes this Langevin dynamic sampling procedure that allows you to draw MCMC -MC samples from your distribution. And in 2D, it kind of looks like this. So you start a sample outside these two distributions, uh, and then you, the gradient guides you towards these likelihood modes, while the noise helps repel you from one likelihood mode to another. And in image space, this looks like this. So you initialize an image from Gaussian noise, and gradually you denoise it to obtain the final image. And this generation procedure, 
has a has a trade off. So essentially, in, in comparison to generation procedures such as GANs, uh, which immediately generate an output, this generation is very iterative and slow. But the benefit is that it allows you to generate for new distributions at a prediction time by just defining new energy functions. So how do you learn these energy functions? Uh, so if I have a set of uh, samples from a distribution P of X, I want to learn an energy function e, e of X that matches uh, so, so that the learned distribution matches the original ground truth distribution. So you can just use maximum likelihood training. So if you just take the gradient of this uh, likelihood, uh, after some uh, rewriting, you essentially get this expression here, where you decrease the energy of real data while increasing the energy of samples drawn from the energy landscape of the model. So this, uh, this type of energy-based model, this has been a well-known generative model for many, many years. Uh, but in 2019, uh, we illustrated how you can scalably train these models in high dimensions using a combination of Langevin dynamics with replay buffers and some L2 penalty to ensure that the energies have similar magnitudes. So graphic, uh, so visually, it looks something like this. So at the beginning, your energy landscape is flat. Uh, and then you decrease the energy of these uh, red truck images while increasing the energy of some sample sampled in from the energy landscape. Now that you have a revised energy landscape, you draw another sample from this landscape. And then you, again, increase the energy of this drawn sample while decreasing the energy of real data. And you just continue to repeat this procedure until your energy landscape exactly matches your real data distribution. And at this point, you decrease the energy of real samples while you increase the energy of real samples also. So another thing you can uh, interpret as energy-based models are diffusion models. Uh, so in 2019, this is the Langevin sampling procedure we uh, proposed. So starting from Gaussian noise, you kind of denoise these images until you have these real images. Uh, and then building on top of our work, there was follow-up work on score-based models, which adapted our Langevin sampling procedure, but learned the gradient of the energy function using a deno denoising score matching. So that is another objective for training energy-based models. Uh, and essentially, you estimate the gradient of the energy function by learning this denoising function. Uh, and you can view diffusion models as a type of score-based model where the inputs are contracted over sampling. So if you look at the sampling procedure of diffusion models now, it's very, very similar to the sampling procedure in energy-based models. So in six, uh, we, we uh, discuss in detail how diffusion models and energy-based models are closely related. Uh, and we also talk about how you can use this, uh, uh, this gradient or denoising estimate to also get an energy value in addition to the gradient. Uh, and throughout the rest of this talk, I'll talk about how you can compose energy-based models. You can essentially apply the same operation to diffusion models by, by adding the gradients together. So if I want to optimize two energy functions, I just add the two predicted gradients or two predicted denoising values from the diffusion model together. Uh, so in my work, I've illustrated how energy-based models can be used to represent distributions across many high-dimensional inputs, ranging from images, robot plans, text, proteins, videos, and 3D shapes. I primarily talk about the embodied setting, uh, but these operations can be applied to these other settings also. Cool. So earlier I talked, uh, gave a bit of introduction on energy-based models. Now I'll talk about compositionality. So the main attractive characteristic about energy-based models is their ability to compose. So if I have a red truck energy function, I can optimize this energy function and get an image of a red truck. The benefit is that inference time, I can take my red truck energy function as, as, as well as a different desert energy function. And just that inference time, just directly optimize the sum of those two energy functions. And now I can get images that satisfy both constraints. And one way to view this is the idea of using loss functions. So normally when we think about constructing composable outputs, we think about loss functions. So if I want a neural network that's able to uh, predict trajectories to reach a goal, uh, that has a particular gate and that avoids obstacles, what I can do is I can gather data for each of these characteristics I want, uh, and then I can just train the neural network on all three of these loss functions. So this is a really composable way to specify behaviors in neural networks. Uh, and what you do is after training, you can just train this neural network on three of these loss functions, and you can get a network that has all three properties. But the issue with using loss functions to compose outputs is that they're not composable at inference time. So if, if I have three loss functions, a uh, loss, a uh, goal, goal seeking loss function, a gate loss function, and an obstacle loss function, and I've trained three different neural networks to optimize each of these three, uh, attribute, uh, these three goals, once I have these three networks, I can't combine these together. So these networks each optimize one goal, but there's no way to combine all three models together to get something that optimizes all three goals. 
So you can view this type of energy company, uh, energy based model as an intermediate loss composition to compose loss functions together. So we, one way to think about it is, uh, let's say I have a loss function in saying that I should reach a goal. I have a loss function that says I want a particular gate, and I have loss function that says avoid obstacles. After training, I get these energy based models one, two, and three. And each energy based model assigns low energy to all solutions that satisfy the respective loss function. So EBM one will have low energy on all points that satisfy the goal function. And now if I directly optimize the sum of these three energy functions and run inference on this energy landscape, I can get predictions that satisfy all three constraints. So essentially you can view these energy functions as loss, as like surrogates for loss functions that allow you to combine properties at prediction time. Uh, so in general, there is a different, there's an algebra to combine energy functions together, depending on what the energy function represents. Uh, so if the energy function represents utility, you can just add the utility together. If the energy function represents set membership, uh, then adding the energies corresponds to taking the intersection of the sets. And if the energy function represents probability distributions, uh, adding the energies corresponds to taking the product of probability distributions. Uh, and there's additional set of operations you can do, which I'll go into detail next. So first, uh, if you have the energy functions that represent utility functions, you can just you can directly add the energy functions together. And by directly adding the energy functions together and optimizing, you can get trajectories that optimize the utility of both particles. So the, the particles go here. More broadly, if you have an energy function for sets, so you have one energy function that has low energy at all points in this blue set, and a second energy function that has, has low energy at all points in this orange set, by optimizing the sum of the energy functions, you can sample from the intersection of the sets. Well, if you, optim if you optimize the soft min of the two energy functions, you'll sample from points that are in either set one or set two. And if you optimize the difference of the two energy functions, now the points that have low energy are exactly the ones in one set and not in the other. And in general, you can actually compose these set operations together. So once you have two sets, well, once you have this new set here, you can apply a thresholding op operation to make it a, a binary again. And then you can just repeatedly apply these set operations. So what this allows us to do is we can take us we can take a, a model that's been trained on a single relation image pair. So we have a data set where I have a small red metal cylinder below a small green rubber cube, as well as a corresponding image. Uh, and what I want to do at prediction time is I want to generate a scene that has this set of relations. So it has a small red metal cylinder below a small green rubber cube, but also a small red metal cylinder to the right of a blue rubber cube and, and this third relation. So I want something that has all three descriptions at prediction time. If I directly try to put this into something like StyleGAN, you can't generate this image. But if you, can, if you treat these as individual sets defined by energy functions, now taking the intersection of these three sets gets you an image with all, with all three properties. And in general, this allows you to generate pretty uh, flexible combinations of objects. So you can do a, a gray cylinder behind a yellow cube or and where there is not a gray cylinder below a brown cube, or you can do something nested. So you can say a gray cylinder behind a yellow cube and a gray cylinder below a brown cube, which are these left two images, or a gray cube behind a brown cube and a gray cube right of a blue sphere, which are the right two images. And finally, you can use these energy operations to represent probability uh, compositions. So you can take the product of two probability distributions uh, by summing up the energies. You can do some type of log sum x operation to take the mixture of two distributions represented as energy-based models. Uh, and you can optimize one energy function and, minim and maximize the other one to take the inversion of two probability distributions. So this has this benefit that you can convert these uh, complex text descriptions into these uh, into this uh, probabilistic expression. So if I want, if I have a simple model that's been trained on simple descriptions such as a horse, sandy beach, or grassy plains, uh, you can sample from this product distribution here, and this essentially gets you an image that has this specification. So you can use this as a post hoc way to modify different probability distributions to do different operations. And what, what this also allows you to do is you can take a model that's been trained on single, like five object scenes. So this model has been trained to make a single object at this location here. And you can just take the product of eight distributions together. And now you can generalize this model trained on five object scenes to scenes with eight objects. Another cool thing you can do is you can define one probability distribution 
over the upright uh, over the upright version of the image, and a second probability distribution over the flipped version of the image. And by jointly optimizing the, this probability distribution here, you can make a painting of a truck here. But at the same time, if you flip the truck over, uh, you, uh, there's a painting of a deer. So you can make these optical illusions by composing probability distributions across the image. So in addition to being able to compose models together, you can also use this energy parameterization to discover composable factors from the inputs. So if you have a training distribution here, you can also discover these independent components that, uh, that comprise this training distribution. And the idea here is that you can take your input image, you can infer a set of latents from this input image so that when you, op uh, when you optimize these energy functions in combination, they reconstruct your original image. So you essentially learn this, you treat this energy model as like a probabilistic decoder, uh, where you pick the product of these uh, probability distributions, each represented by an energy function, and you say that sampling from this probability distribution, which corresponds to optimizing the energy, gets your original sample. And this enforces independence between the components through in the information bottleneck. So you make these latents very low dimensional, so that the latents are forced to capture something meaningful in the image. So this allows you to take an input image consisting of four objects or uh, consisting of faces. Uh, and you can essentially infer these four separate components where here you infer uh, where here each energy function corresponds to an object in the scene. And here each energy function corresponds to some facial appearance or uh, expressions in the image. And by composing these energy functions together, now you can reconstruct your original image. So the benefit of this discovering these composable comp uh, components is again, trying to generalize outside your training data. So what you can do is you can train one model on data set one, uh, where, which consists of spheres and cubes. And you can take two components, which re represent these two objects here. And you can train a separate data, a separate model and discover separate composable components on this data set consisting of boots and trucks. Uh, and, then you can and then you can choose two separate components from the second model. And by composing these two models together, you can now generate these hybrid images that have both boots and trucks, as well as cubes and spheres. And the important thing is neither uh, is that like neither, in this data set, there are no cubes and spheres. And in this data set, there are no boots and trucks. But by composing these discovered components, now you can generate these realistic looking images that are very out of distribution from what you've seen at training time. So that was a brief primer on the algebra in which you compose uh, diffusion models together. Now I'll talk about how you can really apply it in the setting of robotics. So as people, we're able to do very, very complicated tasks. So we can go outside, we can, uh, we can pick up a tomato, we can cut the tomato, we can cut the lettuce. Uh, and in general, we want robot agents that can likewise do a lot of different tasks across a lot of different environments. So recently, a lot of people have been focused on, focusing on this idea of learning from demonstrations. So you gather a lot of demonstrations of a robot doing a particular task, uh, and, then you, and then you hope that the robot can autonomously do the task in a new environment. But the issue here is that there's a huge number of different environments and a huge number of tasks. So what you end up seeing is just a thin slice of the possible combination of environments and tasks that you would want to take. So we can use this idea of compositionality to make this more tractable. So what we do is we take this uh, slice of demonstrations and we represent it as two distributions. One distribution that represents trajectory dynamics and a second distribution that represents the goals of the task. And by decomposing this demonstration in this way, we can again generalize outside the training distribution. So we can cover the entire space of demonstrations by stitching together the dynamics you've seen of, of doing, one, uh, doing one task with the goals of a separate task. So this idea of stitching models together is just planning. So, so this has been a well-explored thing where you learn a, a single feedforward dynamics model that takes in a state in action and predicts the next state. And you recursively apply this single, uh, single state prediction model several times to get a trajectory. And now you can just specify some reward or, uh, or goal that you want to optimize. And you essentially just optimize actions to, uh, to satisfy this reward. But in practice, this is difficult because oftentimes this action optimization will get you to these adversarial states 
that, out, that are out of distribution for your dynamics model. So your reward function will be very high. But actually, these actions do not are not valid actions in your environment. So one way to avoid this issue of optimization is by learning an energy-based model across the entire trajectory. So you take this entire trajectory of, uh, of the trajectory distribution, so S0 to S5, and you feed it into your energy-based model. And this trajectory distribution model will have low energy or will have high energy if any transition is invalid. And it will have low energy only if every single uh, transition distribution in this box is valid. And the benefit of this approach is that now you avoid the issue of adversarial states uh, because, because optimization will only converge to the states that you've seen during training time or like similar to the ones seen at training time. One issue with optimizing trajectories in this way is that it loses the Markov property of forward dynamics models. So if you learn these energy functions at the trajectory level, it can model these trajectories and it can model these trajectories. Uh, but you can't actually model the trajectories that go from here to here because those are not in the training data. And the idea is you can again solve this by just making the generated model compositional. So if you if you make this trajectory level energy function a composition of energy functions that, this, that is defined on one trend, this transition, the second transition, this third transition, then again, you can factorize and generate these trajectories. Uh, so we have some working submission where we actually just compose these energy functions from these pairwise transitions. Uh, but right, uh, but in this, uh, in, in our previous work, we essentially induced this compositionality by making the architectural, uh, architectural level factorization by using temporal convolutions. So once you have this trajectory level energy function, you can combine it with various types of goal specifications uh, or value functions or test time constraints. And this allows you to, uh, to construct a new energy function at composition time uh, to solve a wide range of tasks that you have not seen during training time. So the first thing this enables you to do is reinforcement learning. So you can take an energy function trained on dynamics, which is this energy function one, and now you can combine it with a separate energy function that represents rewards or some value function. And now by directly just optimizing this composition of these two distributions, uh, you, can, you can construct a, a reinforcement learning policy. And what we find is this type of reinforcement learning policy where you, uh, where in, you just take this dynamics model and just like zero shot compose it with a, with a value function, this can actually generalize very, uh, generalize very well. So you can actually perform very similarly to the state of the art offline reinforcement learning techniques that are specific for a particular task while we're just learning this general purpose model. But the benefit of this is that it can general, allow you to generalize and do many different tasks. So you can take this same energy uh, trajectory level energy function and, can, and you can combine it with a separate energy function that specifies a start state S0 and a goal state G. So this can be a hand constructed energy function. And now when you directly optimize the sum of these two energy functions, you can construct a zero shot goal seeking policy that starts at S0 and goes to G. And this kind of looks like this. So you have a start state in the black dot and a goal state in the star. And you, you can construct these very long horizon plans of length up to 512. And this approach substantially outperforms uh, offline and reinforcement learning approaches because the horizon is much longer. But one big benefit of this is that this requires no training on this particular task. Uh, so we just specify a start and go state. While things like things in offline reinforcement learning require you to retrain the model per task. So, so our approach can directly generalize from the single task planning setting to the multi-task planning setting without any training. So this composition allows you to generalize outside the data you've seen. And finally, you can also use this composition to uh, encode different cost functions. So again, you have your trajectory level energy function, and now you have a cost function on the behaviors you want. Uh, and if your normal energy function learns to stack blocks, by adding cost functions of uh, uh, cost functions on the order of the blocks, so you want the gray block on top of the purple one, the purple on top of the red, and the red on top of the blue, now you can get trajectories that stack the blocks in the specified order. And in general, this type of planning can also occur given only visual observations. So you don't need the ground truth state observation at this moment. So here you're just taking the image observation and your energy-based model is just defined over the state space, including your current state. Uh, and we find that this allows you to deploy this in, in real robotic environments. So given 50 demonstrations, you can, uh, you can re robustly upright this mug.
And you can also do these uh, these uh, more deformable tasks, where again, we, per we randomly perturb the inputs, uh, but the model is robust to this. And the final thing this type of trajectory level energy based model allows you to do is it really allows you to do to construct a planner that can generalize across many different environments. So one thing you can do is instead of predicting the states and actions that you want to take in the next next set of states, you can just predict the images conveying what you want to do next. And this has this benefit that you don't have to worry about different state and action spaces between the environments. So if you construct uh, plans in this image space, you can train a single model that can generate this synthetic video. So this is uh, this is synthetically generated, as well as this real video here. And this real video here. So so by, by abstracting the space in which you do planning to the image space, you can actually generalize across many different environments. And this also allows you this like video space planner to learn from the internet. So what you can do is here's a, a video of a person opening a door. But again, this is just a sequence of images conveying what you want to do in the future. So you can train your video model both on the videos of the internet, as well as your videos of your task specific uh, tasks. And the model can, can, is able to absorb all this data and use this to help learn how to, how to transfer this human video to real robot data. So here are two additional examples of synthetic video plans. So this one is put a banana in a pot or a plan. And this is flip, uh, flip a pot upright in a sink. Cool. And then finally, this type of compositionality allows you to combine many multimodal models together for intelligent decision making. So if we think about a very long horizon task, such as make a cup of tea, uh, really effective decision making in this sense, in this setting, requires a lot of different sources of knowledge. So you need to know where to look for a tea kettle or the steps needed to make a steep a tea. A, a steep a tea. Uh, you need to have some visual knowledge of the world. So you need to know the visual properties of objects and their 3D geometry. You need to have some knowledge of the physics of the world. So like the under, underlying materials, physics, and masses of objects. And you, tend, and you need to have some control knowledge. So you need to know how to control your controller to make contact with objects. And the idea is this setting is even more high, high dimensional. So it's extra difficult to be able to gather all the data to train this uh, embodied agent to do all these very long horizon tasks. So one way to solve this is to, is to compose foundation models together or large models. So I'll talk about how you can leverage the information in a large language model, a large video model, and a large action model to zero shot do very long horizon tasks. So to do this, I'm going to introduce a bit more terminal, uh, a bit, a bit more information. So if we have a large, lar a large language model or any type of foundation model, we can always extract the energy energy function from the model, and that just corresponds to the light loss function. So if, for a large language model, if a sentence is in distribution, then its likelihood loss on the sentence will be low, and the energy function will be low. In a similar sense, if you have something like clip, uh, if the language and vision alignment loss is low. Then, and, and then it's in distribution. So we use that to define the energy function. Uh, and for a diffusion model, you can also define an energy function by just measuring the accuracy in which it denoises de outputs. So using this type of energy function allows you to repurpose models to do a variety of different tasks. So, so for example, consider the problem of EQA, where I have this question, what is the cat doing? And I have this image shown here. And what I want to do is I want to use a clip model and a large language model to solve this task. So a large language model by, by itself cannot solve this task because it doesn't actually know how to parse images. And at the same time, a clip model is not able to solve this task because it doesn't have any knowledge of language. So it cannot parse the question, what is the cat doing? But the benefit is by combining these two models together, I can solve this task. So what I can do is I can formulate the answer of generate uh, the formulate the problem of generating a response to this question is optimizing two energy functions. I want to find a response that min maximizes the likelihood of the language model given this question. And I also want to find a response that maximizes the alignment of the language and the image here. 
Now, if I can just optimize for a response that optimizes these two objectives, now I can get something that solves this problem. So, so one uh, small technical issue here is that we actually don't have access to continuous gradients to optimize the language model since it's discrete. Uh, but we can use the same idea of having using a generative model to help your optimization or help your sampling. So what you do is uh, you try to optimize for a language response. So, so you uh, you just use a language model to sample response. Uh, and this sampled response will be high likelihood under the language model. Uh, and then you just uh, select the one that maximizes the clip uh, or minimizes the clip energy the most. And you just repeat that process. So that allows you to get a sample that approximately optimizes both energy functions. And it ends up looking something like this. So your initial response is the cat is catching a mouse. And the next response is cat is walking into a house. And then finally, the answer is the cat is walking in the yard. So in general, you can view this idea of if you just gently optimize two energy functions from two pre-trained models, it, it, it induces a type of communication between the model. So the large language model starts injecting some world knowledge into CLIP and CLIP uh, injects some perceptual grounding on the responses of the large language model. But by directly optimizing these two energy functions, you ensure that the information is shared across the two models. So why is this useful? So let's go back to the example I was talking about earlier, where I want to make a plan for making a cup of tea. So I want to construct a plan that is semantically possible, that's geometrically possible, and that's physically executable on the robot. Uh, so if I use a large language model to directly generate a plan for this setting, it's not sufficient because it will tell you some high level responses that may be possible to make to do the task but it doesn't actually ground the language model in the real world. So it doesn't see the images. So it doesn't know what language responses are actually possible in the real world. So a video model like the one I presented earlier can tell you what images are possible given a language instruction, but it doesn't have this high level reasoning over languages. And similarly, the egocentric action model doesn't have enough information. But the thought process is we can do the same optimization of procedure I talked about earlier in this setting. So I can have the language model generate different language plans. And I can use my video model to select which language plans are possible. So the video model will be given a language plan and it will try to synthesize a video. And then if the, it cannot synthesize a video, then we know the plan, the, the language plan is not, is not possible given the visual dynamics of the world. So, so this type, so this uh, bi-level optimization uh, in, induces uh, you to pass high-level inf action information to the video model and get physical plausibility feedback back. In the same sense, this video model can generate a video, and then this egocentric action model can try to infer actions from it. And if it cannot, then we know that this video is not actually plausible in the world. So it can give you some feedback on kin kinematic plausibility. So by jointly optimizing uh, a sequence of language instructions, visual instructions, and action instructions across these three models, then you can get a consistent hierarchical plan that solves this task, even though each of these individual models are not trained to do this hierarchical planning. And so, so, so what does this actually visually look like? So, you, so if you have a goal, stack a red block on top of a cyan block and place a brown box block to the right of the stack. So initially, your language model, which does not see the starting image, will generate something that is not plausible. So it will say, place a cyan block in a brown box. And the model will synthesize this made-up video. But now, the video model gives feedback to the language model, saying that it's not possible. So now the language model can generate a new command, such as place a white block in a cyan block. And now the video model is able to synthesize a valid plan. And you can repeat this procedure until you get an entire plan that's consistent for your environment. And so, uh, so you can also do this for vision language models, where now the energy function you optimize is this uh, VLM, like predicted task progress, given the video generations. Uh, but this has a, th this can, uh, so you can visualize this here, where now you have a, a language instruction, put the fruits into the top drawer, and you have a starting image shown here. And essentially, again, in this setting, the, the language, uh, the vision language model now proposes a set of actions. And now your video model renders these actions into videos. And, the, and then the vision language model takes in the last frame in this rendered video and assesses how good it is. And you pick the one that's the best. And then you repeat this process where now again at the step, the language model proposes an action and the video model renders it. And then the vision language model chooses the best one, which is now uh, placed the banana in the top drawer. And then at this step, 
Uh, now, now your video, now your uh, visual language model proposes three actions. Uh, and again, you uh, your video model. These are all rendered videos. So the video model renders these three videos. And now you get this uh, video of uh, you get this instruction. Place the apple in the top drawer. And finally, you get the instruction. Close the top drawer. So this optimization pr procedure eventually allows you to get this very long horizon video plan that successfully that successfully specifies this whole task. And once you have this video plan, you can just convert it to direct execution. Uh, so this is uh, this is execution on the real robot. So the robot is able to successfully pick up the two objects uh, and then close the drawer. And you can also here, here. So here's another. So here's another goal. So this in in this setting, the goal is make a line. Uh, and if we just directly try to make uh, accomplish the goal, make a line using a single large monolithic video model, this is what you get. So these are this is generated video, but you can see that the generated video isn't able to really generate a video plan to actually make a line. And if you try to compose the two models together, so you just use let's say use a vision language model with a video model, but you don't do this like iterative refinement or optimization procedure. Uh, again, you cannot make a line. So you just you just move these blocks around, but you end up not making a line. But now, but now if you compose all of these models together, uh, now you can make a line. So let me play it again. So so you start here, but now by optimizing uh, each of these models together, now you can now you can get this uh, this completely synthesized video that in precise detail manipulates the objects into a line. So essentially, this type of optimization or inference time procedure allows you to generate these much more complex plans than the ones the, your original models are trained on. And we also compare this with a bunch of other foundation models for robotics. So we compare it with things like RT2 and PAMI. Uh, and what we find is that our approach substantially outperforms all the other approaches in terms of long, long horizon performance. And one, uh, and one thing is these are tasks here. Uh, we're actually uh, the data for these tasks were gathered uh, a, a year or so before we did this project, and because the tasks were so long horizon before our our, our paper, uh, they were unable to use these demonstrations to solve these tasks. Cool. So overall, in this talk, I've introduced the idea of energy-based models. I've been talked about how we can compose them together. I've then talked about how you can apply it in the setting of robotics, and finally, I talked about how you can apply it in the setting of multimodal models. So overall. What 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 do I think about so right now at the moment everyone wants to generate these large multimodal models, so people want to take uh, these uh, this large multimodal model that takes in vision language action and audio and then it predicts the subsequent actions and language to execute. But in practice, this distribution probably is too hard to effectively model with current tools, uh, and even if the distribution were not uh, too hard to model. A lot of the data for modeling these distributions is missing. And then finally, it's really hard to model this large monolithic model to fit very new generative distributions. So the so the present uh, so the uh, components I've talked about earlier earlier in this talk point to this more decentralized architecture, where instead of trying to train one giant monolithic model to uh, to construct an intelligent embodied agent, we should instead compose many different models together and use inference or optimization between these models as a way to combine them together and get their strengths. So as an example, um, one, uh, what I've talked about with the clip model and the large language model is an example of how you can combine these two models to do image captioning. Well, what I talked about in terms of combining a language model with a video model and action model is, is an example of using, combining these three models to do hierarchical planning. But in general, I think that we can construct a very complex generative system by combining all of these multimodal models operating across different modalities at different temporal scales. And one nice thing about this type of compositional generative architecture towards constructing intelligent agents is the fact that it's very modular. So one institution can focus on getting the best image model. Another institution can focus on getting the best language model or the best video model. And we can all independently develop this system. And I think, of course, there's uh, this architecture here is pretty arbitrary. So in practice, probably it makes a lot more sense to have the, uh, to have the image model connect with the video model. But I think there's a lot of interesting research to be done on how to discover the right graph structure uh, to, compo to compose models together. 
for example, uh, connections between the image and video model, or finding the right connection to add additional modalities that is such as audio into the model. And finally, there's a lot of, so uh, in this talk, I've illustrated how inference time computation in the form of energy optimization can be used to like allow your model to generalize in very interesting ways, whether it's generalization in the compositional sense, uh, uh, generalization in terms of planning or generalization to new constraints. And then in general, I think there are a lot more ways in which we can use inference between models to get better performance. So one example that I've been working on is also this idea of multi-agent debate. So if you have three language models, uh, uh, you can actually use intermediate uh, conversation between models as a way to improve models also. So each language model given a question will generate an initial response. And then each other language model will give a critique of the response of the first language model. And this type of inference time computation, where you start with this question, there are 175 diamonds and 35 fewer rubies, how many gems are in the chest? And you essentially just repeat through this procedure here. This type of computation allows you to induce complexity and allows you to get much more systematic reasoning and factuality in models. So you can do inference time computation between models, even in the form of language, as a way to like induce complexity and induce like this more systematic reasoning that can allow better reasoning and factuality. And then finally, uh, a lot of this, so a lot of this talk has been about like improving generative models by improving their compositional structure. I think there's also lots of work, other ways to improve generative models. Uh, so in the setting of, in particular of image models, uh, so it, images lie in 3D space. So you can use 3D structure to really get better image models. And in general, uh, we've been training all, all the generative models we've trained so far are trained by maximum likelihood by minimizing the KL loss. But in general, probably we don't want to train generative models by simply maximizing likelihood, we probably want to optimize generative models for the objectives that we care about. So one way to do this is using reinforcement learning training. But I think there's a ton of work left in training generative models with non-maximum likelihood objectives or other objectives that are task specific. And finally, you can also use this idea of compositional generative modeling, not just in this embodied setting, but across many other settings, such as the sciences and engineering. So in practice, we really want, in the sciences, we really want to generate things that are probably outside our training distribution. So if we have some natural proteins, uh, we probably, we, we want to generate proteins that are different from the natural proteins. And one way you can do this is you can use the same idea of compositionality. So you can learn one distribution that models the sequence of amino acids, and then you can learn a separate distribution that models the 3D structure of proteins. And by composing these two distributions together, you can generate proteins that are outside the manifold of natural proteins. So, so we did this. Um, so we did this sampling procedure, and we found that you can synthesize these proteins that have very low sequence identity with existing proteins, while also having pretty high confidence in terms of structure prediction. And finally, these generative models also are not necessarily only needed for generation. So you can also use generative models to do things like simulation uh, or, in, or design uh, or like robustness or like there are so many other applications for generative models. So here we, we use the generative model as a simulator where we combine different generative, where we compose different generative models together to simulate longer dynamics. And we found that this was in, this enabled us to design systems that were much more complex than the ones we'd seen at training. Uh, great, thanks for listening and let me know if you have any questions. Thank you. I think Josh has some questions. So I had two questions from the um, second paper on like compositionality. Mm -hmm. So like what's what's the limit of the number? So if you have one picture where you were combining two captions, like this caption and that caption, generate a um, an image that satisfies both of these constraints, right? Mm -hmm. How many captions could you potentially combine? Could you like just combine the whole data set, right? Like what's the limit there? You know what I mean? Yeah, I think so. So what we found is when you start combining more than like four or five captions, it starts becoming finicky because you don't know exactly which captions to optimize, right? So like, uh, so so when you have like when you have like maybe more than four or five captions, then probably four of the captions will be optimized, and maybe one caption will not be optimized. Uh, so I in principle, I think it depends on the domain. So so if your constraints that you're combining are one hot, 
right? Then it's pretty easy to combine many, many models together. But I think when your things are language where there are these soft constraints, then if you have like a couple of sentences and one sentence says, like one sentence, one sentence biases your generation to a desert, another one biases it to like towards the ocean, then like you start having these conflicting constraints and then you can't actually optimize all of them well. Yeah, so as long as they're not conflicting, you can get at least four or five. Yeah, so I think when they're like, so so yeah, so in natural language four or five with other settings, we can get like 10 or more sometimes. Uh, so 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 I think the harder the harder your constraints are, right? So if your constraints are zero, zero, one constraints, then you can combine a lot of them. Okay, and then um it so in in the, like the facial recognition one, you talked about some different features of someone's face, mouth, eyes, whatever. Um so you are manually um setting up those constraints, right? Like you're saying, oh, let's look at the eyes, let's look at the mouth. This is in the composition. Are you following what I'm talking about? Uh, so, oh yeah, so this is the unsupervised decomposition portion, right? Oh, it's unsupervised? Yeah, so that, that portion where it's like looking at the faces and the, the, that's unsupervised. So we actually don't, so like those the, those four components are discovered. Okay, and then um, the other question I had, so the, the generation ones and a lot of the QA ones, yeah, like you're working with natural language, right? But then mm -hmm. um, when you talk about the constraints, you talk about splitting sentences into these um, elements of like this noun, this adjective, whatever, like into different components. Are, are those, are you using parsers? Like are parsers working effectively to be able, uh, effectively enough to be able to do that? Or are you manually like putting those in? Yeah, so in those examples, we manually put it in. I think we also actually tried afterwards to use parsers. It so if you use something like GPT three, it actually works very well. So you just give it a couple examples, and then it can actually parse quite accurately. And then yeah, and then the, the last one is the optical illusion image that you had there. Was that intended for it to become an optical illusion like that, or is that just what happened? Uh, so so yeah, so that that paper actually we didn't write, someone else wrote. Uh, but yeah, so essentially they ex they were explicitly trying to construct optical illusions, and what they did is they defined one probability distribution over the upright version of the image with one text instruction, and they defined a different version of the like they just flipped the image and defined it as a different image, a different text description. So that they intentionally were trying to make it into an optical illusion. Yeah, yeah I was wondering if that like it's just something that just sort of started presenting itself when you were adding more captions or whatever, like you start getting these weird combinatorial effects, or if it was something that like was like intended and it sounds like that was intended by just changing the orientation of the image. Yeah, uh, we actually, so earlier on, we, uh, so th this uh, this optical illusion paper came out around one year after our original paper in this area. Uh, when we were exploring our original paper, we also found that, like, if sometimes if you say a sky and a dog, uh, what would happen is our model would, like, generate a sky where the clouds kind of look like a dog, but maybe you want a dog in the sky. So we we found that, that it seemed like uh, this the, the sort of composition we got from our system is a different type of composition than what you would get from just, like, giving these the, the entire sentence into a text to image model. Yeah, I think we have one more question. Oh, okay. Um, you had like, were you uh, comparing us offline reinforcement learning methods? And I was just wondering if you uh, kind of tried to test for stitching, because you mentioned uh, combinations of things, like you had the different colored blocks and then you had like the horseshoes. Have you tried mm -hmm. stitching and things like that? Uh, okay, so so on the offline reinforcement learning settings, uh, in principle, to do well on the benchmarks, right, you do have to stitch the trajectories together. Uh, yeah. So I, so we definitely observed stitching in this planning setting, because uh, if you actually look at the trajectories that you see, uh, like the demonstration trajectories, they're all very, uh, they're all very jagged, uh, and they jump all over the place. Uh, but the but the optimized trajectory that we got is smooth. So there is definitely some stitching in the model. Uh, do we have any other questions? Uh, on Zoom? <laughs> okay. uh, if no one has, then I have a couple of questions. So, uh, in initially, you presented that, uh, that you can compose the clip and LLNs to do visual grounding. So, we very well know that clip models are also not, it, it behaves like bag of words, right? They are not also good at composition understanding. 
So do you think that like when you try to compose this uh, not so good uh, models, like how does the performance look like? Is it still observed that uh, generated captions are not composably accurate? Like great, uh, let's say black apple or some, some weird compositions that we don't see in day to day life. Oh, I see. So it's a question that, um, so, so, okay. So I guess, uh, I, uh, so I guess maybe there are two questions. So I think one question is, uh, so if the models are, are kind of poor, does this composition still help? I, I think so. Right. Because the models will have, are capturing different sources of information. So by composing them together, you're combining the information across models. So I think that would help, uh, is the first question. And the second question I think was, uh, uh, but will the model be more compositional? Uh, so I think one thing to think about is, uh, so when we say compositional, right, what we, uh, in the probabilistic sense, sense, what we mean is we want to find the right independent structure. So we want to find, so like compositional means that we know that these two distributions, this, I've learned this small local distribution for this portion. I know that I can repeat it in this other portion. So I think, uh, so, I, so generating compositional captions means just discovering the right independent structure in language uh, to be able to do it. So in some of, some of my work, I sh showed how you could, uh, some toy examples on how you can discover some uh, some independent structure. I think if that were to were skilled, uh, skilled in this language setting, it could help solve the compositional uh, captioning ability of, of language models. I see. Yeah, yeah, that that actually makes sense. And I have one last question that is, I think, more open ended. So we very well know that like these LLMs or diffusion models or anything require a lot of data to training. And here you are showing very interesting perspective. Like if you know these. Uh, orthogonal directions or something, then you can try to cover like this energy based models can cover a whole variety of distributions. But can we like how many compositions or how many orthogonal directions are there in let's say in a text space? Like how can we know that uh, we have covered sufficient amount of uh, orthogonal axis to cover all sorts of composition for let's say diffusion models? Yeah, so yeah, so that, that that's a question, right? Like, we also don't know what exactly are the independence axes, even on like this language revision setting. Yeah. Uh, so in practice, I I also don't know if you can make your, so so I think it's it's really hard to say like, for sure we've covered the, all the independence structures or we covered all the amount of data that we can possibly generalize, right? I think that this type of compositional factorization can allow you to generalize to bigger space of data than the than, than what you can do well, uh, can, can do by just training one gen monolithic model. I also don't think you can actually, I guess there's no way to know that you covered all the independent structure, right? In particular, if you've never, if you haven't seen a combination of language before, or like if you haven't seen like a particular type of language before, right? Like I show that you can take these two axes and you can compose them together. Uh, but like, what if you haven't seen one part of the axis, right? Uh, yeah. Then no way you can actually generalize there. So I, I kind of see this approach as like a way to improve generalization, but yeah, I, I don't know if you can actually have guarantees on like covering all possible generalized portions. Yeah. Although I do think it's very interesting to see how much how, how much you can actually discover this unsupervised structure for this composition. Like I, I do think people haven't really thought much about like discovering compositional structure uh, to do compositional text and image synthesis. At the moment, everyone's just like training one giant monolithic model to do. They just want to outperform the other industry models. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I think that's a pretty interesting area of research potentially. Yeah, again, uh, thanks again for the talk. Like if anyone has any more questions, like, or uh, if not, then we can just wrap up the today's talk. Yeah, all right, Jiren, I think uh, no one else has the question. And okay. thanks again for joining for this talk. Like uh, we got a lot many insights. Okay, great, thank you. Cool. Yeah. Okay.